hay a Gustavo Zapodni, de editor in chief of the World Stroke Organization, World Stroke Academy, for the World Stroke Organization. And we have the opportunity this Sunday morning uh, to uh, have an uh, interview uh, to the, uh, uh, Dr. Tan Nugen. She is the uh, director of the interventional neurology and, neuro and neuroradiology and professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and uh, radiology at Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, uh, Dr. Nugent has authored over 150 publications, and uh, recently she was elected the president elect for the Vascular Society and Vascular and Interventional Neurology. So we have the privilege to have a uh, uh, Tan today to ask her some specific questions about her recent uh, publication and uh, to think about, you know, uh, the future advances. So Tan, welcome and uh, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning and on a Sunday morning. And uh, uh, could you summarize the, the, the results of your study? Uh, thank you, Gustavo, for the very kind introduction. Hello to all uh, members of the World Stroke Academy. It's a great privilege to be here uh, to share with you some of the work we've been working on recently with regards to um, imaging of patients in the late window. So uh, the study we did was called CT for Late Endovascular Reperfusion, or the CLEAR study. And uh, the reason we were interested in this was because after the publication of the DAWN and the Diffuse 3 trials in 2017 and 2018, showing the significant benefit of thrombectomy in the late window, we were very intrigued in looking at how we could potentially expand the treatment paradigms for patients um, who didn't have access to advanced imaging, which was required in these two studies for entry. And as you know, after the publication of the Dawn and Diffuse 3 trials, both the European Stroke Organization and the American Heart Association recommended that it was important to include patients for thrombectomy based on the selection paradigms that were utilized from these two large trials. So thank you, uh, uh, Tan. So now we have some follow-up questions. So, uh, uh, so what are the main findings and the implications? Sure, so this was a large multi-center study across um, 15 centers and five countries. We were looking at centers that had both the uh, ability to offer CT or CTP or MRI um, for their patients who were presenting in the late window. And so what the main findings were was across a cohort of a total of about 1,500 patients, we found that patients who were selected by non-contrast head CT had similar outcomes as those who were selected by advanced imaging, i.e. CT perfusion or MRI. And what's important to note is that of those who were selected with non-contrast head CT, these patients had very good looking CAT scans coming into the study in the six to 24 hour time window, meaning they had a median aspects score, aspects being Alberta stroke program, early CT score, a widely used score in stroke literature um, of a median of eight and the interquartile range, meaning the spread of the aspect scores coming into the study was uh, from seven to nine. So very good looking CAT scans of the patients coming into uh, the CLEAR study. The other interesting finding that we noticed was that of those patients who presented to the mothership, meaning that they presented directly to the endovascular, they were non-transfer centers, we looked at the time metrics and the workflow of those who were selected by non-contrast CT only versus CTP or MRI. And we found that those who were selected by non-contrast head CT had faster times to treatment compared to those selected by CTP or MRI faster than about 20 to 30 minutes on average. Well, thank you, Tan, that's uh, very interesting. So I have some follow-up questions. So you mentioned that uh, in, the, in the article that advances in medical, uh, in medical images uh, uh, don't necessarily translate into better clinical outcomes. So the question is, instead of making more complex and detail-oriented information to make stroke care decisions, you are going, it seems that you are going the other way around. So the question is, when the world is moving more towards advanced technology, so you are proposing to go, especially with more, a more simplistic approach with the CT and CT angiogram. So could you comment on that? 
That's a fantastic question, Gustavo. Yes, we're seeing a lot, an explosion of artificial intelligence and the rise of the machines, and, and we're trying to keep pace with them. However, we have to think about the spread in the world. I mean, this is the World Stroke Academy. And as of 2021, mechanical thrombectomy is not even available in many countries in Africa. IV thrombol thrombolysis is not even available in many countries in Africa. And, I, and we know this because of our world uh, COVID spin projects. So that being said, if mechanical thrombectomy is not even available, how, how do you think, how, how is uh, advanced imaging available in many of these countries? And so one of the studies that came out from UT Houston, Dr. Sunil Sheth and colleagues found that in a state as resource rich as Texas, so Texas, you know, very rich state in the United States, they were looking at how available is advanced imaging in a cohort of Medicare patients. It was a you know, statewide uh, database for using the Medicare data set. And CT perfusion was available in about 14% of the cohort of these patients they were looking at in Texas. And that was as of 2017. So most patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke were coming to hospitals that didn't have CTP in Texas. So if we think Texas is the microcosm of the United States and a rich microcosm of the United States. That probably says that we don't have this advanced imaging widely available, not only in the United States, but also across the world. And that disparity is probably accentuated in low middle income countries. And so while the world is accelerating towards AI, which is wonderful, I think there's a role for AI, artificial intelligence, in areas where they don't have rapid access to people to interpret the images. So the primary stroke center is where we often see long delays from the time of image acquisition to the radiologist read. It could be easily an hour. And then you realize how much time you've lost. That's where I think AI has a huge, huge presence or a huge benefit to help accelerate these decisions. But in training programs, academic centers, tertiary care centers, where you have lots of people, resources, teams, stroke teams, trainees, interventionalists, radiologists, neuroradiologists who are interpreting these images and making these decisions, I think we need to scale back from AI and learn how to learn from the basics, looking at the regular non-contrast head CT, which is very telling. Um, Dr. Noguera at uh, this uh, SBIN meeting we went to recently had a very nice quote about non-contrast head CT when he was talking about the Aurora study. He says, you know, head, head CT is like a, a red wine. It, it gets better with time, meaning that as time goes by, you can see the infarct better on a head CT than in the late window compared to the early window. And that's intuitively obvious. So we want to train our trainees with the the simple imaging, non-contrasted CT, which can be very telling. So thank you, Tan. So just to clarify for the audience, when you mention non-contrast non CT, you are referring specifically to uh, CT and CT angiogram. Am I right? Yes, thank you for okay. clarifying that. Yeah, this is a very important point. So the CT is meant to look for the parenchyma and the CTA, obviously you need that to look for the vessel occlusion in, uh, status. So those are two very different questions and we do want to emphasize the importance of CTA so you can detect or know that there's an occlusion, but then also based on the parenchyma, CT may be enough. Less is more. Thank you. So now the question is, and this is my one of my last questions is, you show that the, you know there are some remarkable models of brain imaging using artificial intelligence, but they're still not showing an improvement in patients' outcomes. So why? What do you think are the reasons for for that? I think the reasons for that are that humans are as good as showing improved outcomes without these artificial intelligence. We are the ones who inputted into these AI algorithms what to select and how to report who could benefit from thrombectomy. So we've made those decisions for the machines. And so I think if we continue to do what we're supposed to do is meaning, you know, think and decide who is a potential candidate for thrombectomy, for treatment, for intervention or not. It's a binary decision. We can still make lots of inroads um, with our own uh, minds. Thank you, Tan. Is there anything that you would like to add or thinking about, you know, the uh, uh, future? What uh, do you have uh, any other thoughts that you would like to share with the audience? Yeah, so we're very excited that uh, Mr. Clean Late uh, will be having their results soon. Um, I think they're close to 
finishing enrollment or, or maybe already finished enrollment for their Mr. Clean Lake study, which is CT, CTA with collaterals compared to medical management. So it's scaling away from advanced imaging. I think those studies will be very important to try to get us level one uh, evidence for recommendation that we can scale back from advanced imaging in the late window. And then the Resilient Extend uh, study in Brazil is also ongoing. So we encourage enrollment in those trials to try and get us more answers for optimal imaging in the late window. Thank you very much, Tan. Uh, very much appreciated. It has been a great pleasure for us to have you, you know, uh, for the WSA and for the World Stroke Organization. Thank you very much for your availability. Much appreciated. Thank you, Gustavo and the World Stroke Academy. It's a great pleasure.